Hi everyone, welcome to the first episode of Kelowna Pocus. Today we'll be talking about the IVC, how to find it, how to measure it, and what it might mean. My name is Mark Sanderson, I'm a PGY1 emergency medicine resident at the University of British Columbia Interior Site in Kelowna, BC. So this is a video project for my ultrasound rotation put together by our fantastic ultrasound director, Dr. Jeff Sands. And my objectives for the video are to familiarize you with position and draping, obtaining a longitudinal view of the IVC, either from a transverse or longitudinal approach, how to generate an image of the IVC in our area of interest, and how to generate a useful clinical data point from the image. We won't be diving into the research on the topic. This is meant to be a pretty basic introduction to the IVC scan, but I'll put some suggestions for further reading at the end of the video. First off, you want to properly position your patient. This test is meant to be performed in the supine position and expose your patient only as needed, in this case from the umbilicus to the costal margin. Select your probe. We're going to want a low frequency probe, either the curvilinear or phased array probe. We'll go with the curvilinear today. Generously apply ultrasound gel to the probe and the patient and ensure your machine is in the abdominal preset. Decide on what approach you want to take. There are two techniques, starting in transverse or starting in longitudinal. I'll show you the transverse technique first. You're going to start with the probe marker to the patient's right and place the probe in the midline of the epigastrium. Identify the spine shadow and note the aorta. Once you have identified the IVC, center it in your screen and rotate your probe cephalad to bring it into the longitudinal axis. You can then heal your probe as needed to view the intrahepatic IVC, our area of interest. Looking at the anatomy, we can see that in the transverse we can identify our spine shadow in the far field, and just near field to that, a compressible anechoic structure that varies with respiration, and a thicker walled, less compressible circular structure to the patient's left, the IVC and the aorta respectively. As we rotate the probe into the long axis, we're going to start to see new structures appear. The hepatic vein appears within the liver, and the right atrium comes into view screen left. Find your best view of the IVC, that which has maximal AP diameter, and train your eye to look at the area 2 centimeters caudal to the confluence of the hepatic vein and the IVC. Assess the IVC for collapsibility with normal respirations here. If the IVC is collapsing by 30% or greater, which is approximately what can be assessed by the naked eye, this suggests fluid responsiveness or at least fluid tolerance in some patients. Looking at Jamie's IVC, we can see here that it doesn't vary greatly with respiration. To obtain our longitudinal view, we take our probe with marker-oriented cephalad and place it slightly to the right of midline in the epigastrium, heal up through the liver, and slide to the patient's right until the IVC comes into view. Watch that again. Place the probe in the epigastrium and slowly slide to the right until the IVC comes into view. You can confirm that it is the IVC by compressing it with the probe, viewing it empty into the right atrium, or asking the patient to sniff, generating negative intrathoracic pressure, and watching the IVC collapse. The hepatic vein is once again visible, and we really want to train our eye to assess resp variation about 2 centimeters caudal to its confluence with the IVC. Another data point to help you is the absolute end expiration AP diameter measured in the same spot, 2 centimeters caudal to the hepatic vein. Freeze your image on the screen and use your calipers to measure the AP diameter of the IVC. Another useful tool is to assess IVC collapsibility using M-Mode. Place your M-Mode cursor in the same area of interest, 2 centimeters caudal to the hepatic vein, and press M-Mode again. Hold the probe steady and watch the tracing for collapse in a structure at the same depth as the IVC. We'll finish off with a few loops of some patients with low or collapsed IVCs. The literature out there is constantly evolving, but a good rule of thumb seems to be that collapsibility is more useful than absolute diameter, and that anything greater than 30-50% to 50 collapsibility is indicative of fluid tolerance or responsiveness, depending on whose interpretation you subscribe to. A quick recap, use a low-frequency probe in the abdominal setting, and take your measurements about 2 centimeters caudal to the confluence of the hepatic vein and the IVC. Some groups say 1 centimeter, and some say anywhere in the caudal half of the liver is probably okay. Collapsibility appears to be more useful than AP diameter, hey, we're all different sizes, right? But really flat IVCs and really dynamic states should be fluid tolerant. Look for collapsibility of 30 to 50% or greater, depending on the literature you read, and look for an AP diameter less than 1.2 centimeters. And remember that a small IVC might appear to collapse less than a big dynamic one, and that patient might still need fluid. Always remember to use your clinical judgment first. This is only a useful data point in your patient assessment.
I want to thank everyone in our physician group, and especially all those who helped out in our ultrasound rotation. Big thank you to Dr. Jeff Sands, our amazing ultrasound director, without whom I definitely wouldn't have been motivated to do this video, and to my co-resident slash ultrasound model, Dr. Jamie Powell. If you like the video or just want to see more videos, want to share your own experiences, tips, and tricks, you can get in touch with me or the Kelowna Emergency Group via Twitter, at Mark Sanderson underscore and at Kelowna EM. And if you really want to make this guy happy, that's Jeff with his portable ultrasound, you can like this video or retweet it. Thanks for watching.